So welcome to our event that's part of uh, International Women's Week, we're calling it. Um, we've run a number of events um, over uh, the last seven days, looking at all sorts of um, themes and stories uh, that all around the Inspire Inclusion topic, which is this year's International uh, uh, Women's Day or Women's Week or Month um, kind of main core theme. Uh, as I've said uh, previously, we have a real interest in history and heritage and learning from women change makers of the past to short circuit change for the future. Um, and, you know, we hear of the traditional usual suspects like your Emmeline Pankhurst, you know, being from Manchester here and, you know, various other women that crop up who perhaps come up in, in the media or in history time after time. Um, but I'm personally more interested in much more uh, diverse range of stories and the stories of women in our networks and the stories of modern day or more modern day women as well as those perhaps from, from our past history to kind of really enrich what we know about how women are a force for social change in many different ways and um, stop reinventing the wheel where we can and, and definitely learn you know from uh, the ways that people in our past have sought to change things um, so tonight, really, we're going to hear from a great panel of um, people who will give us um, a little bit of a, an overview of their interest in this topic. They're all quite different in terms of what they're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to have Jessica Simons probably up first. Um, she's a change maker in uh, the tech world and a social anthropologist, Dr. Jessica Simons. And she's going to be sharing reflections on a, the history of a range of women change makers. And she's, like myself, has been very involved and interested in this topic for some time. Uh, we're then going to have um, Mariana uh, Vas, I will say your name wrong. Vasiliev. Vasiliev, um, both an entrepreneur, campaigner, change maker in her own right. Uh, she's part of United for Ukraine. Uh, she's been living here in the UK for, for 10 years or more, and she's going to share some insights into the women's movement in Ukraine, past and present, um, and also a little bit about the role that her grandmother's played um, in some of this uh, history as well. Uh, we've got Soraya um, Agaolu, <laughs> I want to say, uh, entrepreneur, storyteller, well-being practitioner. Um, she's the community empowerment lead for um, Stockport uh, Race Equality Partnership, amongst various other things. And she's going to um, highlight different uh, women change makers and actually how a chance meeting of somebody in South Africa um, some time ago um, change the course of, of her life and I don't want to spoil that so she'll tell you more and then we're going to um, close our panel um, hearing from uh, Michaela Parnell who's been part of our network for some time again change maker and a scientist and um, she's going to share how she's been using ancestry which is like one of those online sort of family tree type tools that some people might have heard of and um, she's been using this in recent times to explore her own history and her own family and doing some really interesting stuff uh, to sort of highlight and amplify the impact of a relative that she's come across who is part of the Irish suffrage movement. So we've got an eclectic mixed bag of stories and journeys to go on. Um, and we'll definitely um, take some questions either as we go or um, towards the end. So um, I'm not gonna leave this up because we'll want to see our actual speakers, but I thought I'd just give you a feel for who we've got talking before we ask them to come and say a bit more. So um, if I can, Jess, I think we've uh, got you up first, if, if that's okay. Sure, no problem. Hello everyone, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna share my screen. Right. right, can you see that? We can see that. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. great, okay. Um, Hold on, I'll go on back. So uh, I wanted to put the project that we've done or the, or, or the task that Nicola set me of doing a presentation about uh, change makers, I put into the context of my company and how, um, how I've been doing with my company because I thought it might be quite an interesting angle to come in at. Um, and uh, to tell you about a project that I developed with my team about uh, three years ago. Um, it was called The Strong Women of Victoria and Manchester. And I wanna tell you the sort of story of the journey of that project. And I will tell you about the women in the process and then go on to talk about what I'm doing next. 
So it's, it's showing the kind of building blocks of, of how ideas progress. So first, about me, I've um, I've been doing this for uh, quite a long time in different ways, different capacities. So um, I, I am an anthropologist. I got a PhD in anthropology about 10 years ago, but I've been working in IT and digital for about uh, 25 years. Um, and I used to run my social and environmental activism alongside being a digital consultant, but recently I've brought them together. So now I do research into emerging concepts and technologies and see how they can tackle social and environmental problems. Um, so I'm a social entrepreneur in the sense that I have these aspirations, but I'm actually trying to run a viable business. And so my challenge of what I've been doing over these past five years of running Vision Lab is trying to find a way of doing good work and also generating an income. <laughs> So just to tell you about uh, the, how this project was born. So I've, I've done a lot of research in Manchester. My PhD was based in Manchester. And um, so I know a lot about the history of the city already. Um, and I was actually looking into who were the key people who were involved in the formation of Manchester. And this is a spreadsheet here. You can see the names of the people um, and it was in order to create what's called a social network analysis graph, which is uh, a, a tool that you can use where you can connect um, different people together to show their relationships between them. And it creates this massive sort of spider diagram. And in the, um, so we needed a lot of people. So we were like making this spreadsheet. And the reason why I've circled this is red is you can see the gender of all the people uh, that we were pulling out um, and they were uh, mainly made. So um, I, I don't have my team anymore, but I had a really great um, a, a young person working for me called Ellie Andrews, who, who went on to work at the BBC now. Um, and she did a, this research, so it's important that I, I credit her work. Um, so we started looking for women um, who had played a, a key and interesting role in the development of Victorian Manchester um, and, um, and, and what they did. We made a point of trying to find a diverse uh, selection of women. Um, and we uh, settled on six. So I'll, I'll tell you about those, those six women. The first one is Annie Horniman. Um, you uh, you can see where we are in 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 time in the sense that she she was a, a leader of the theatre movement in Britain um, and she was quite a character apparently um, as you can see on below she wore trousers and smoked openly <laughs> which uh, you know was a, uh, a a shocking thing to do at the time. Uh, she was lucky in that she came from a wealthy family, so she was able to both pursue her interests and live the way she chose to live because her family had made their fortune from tea. And uh, she bought the Gaiety Theatre on Peter Street, which isn't actually there anymore. Um, it's where the Costa is now, or the, that corner uh, just opposite the Midland mm -hmm. Hotel is where the theatre was. And then there's Annie Kenny. Uh, she was an activist in the senior leadership. You think about the in, in Manchester at the time, it was really the birth of the union, the idea of the union, the idea of uh, working class people coming together in the factories and agitating for um, their rights uh, for better pay, better conditions, um, children not working. Uh, was, was the idea of it, and this is what I find so exciting about Manchester's history, is the idea that uh, people could form together and stand up against the uh, the industrious, the owners of the factories, was born here. Um, and you can probably imagine that it was primarily men who were involved in that. There are lots of women involved in the social um, organising of it, but as soon as you get into positions of leadership, uh, doesn't matter whether or not it's uh, aristocracy, industrialists, or in working class circles, it was still men who put themselves forward as uh, the ones who should be leaders. Um, 
but Annie Kenny was someone who had the strength to push herself forward and, and um, take a senior role. And she's rather famously uh, sheltered um, at uh, a, a key politician, Edward, Edward Gray. Will the Liberal government give votes to women? I think he might have been Prime Minister at the time. Um, Enriquez Ryland's another really interesting woman. So um, I'm sure you all know uh, the library down on Deansgate, that really beautiful building that sits near the court, um, Manchester uh, Crown Criminal Court. Um, well, she was the wife of John Ryland. She was his, his wife's nurse. Um, and uh, she looked after the wife. I think she was in Yorkshire and then she got hired into the family. Uh, and the family lived in, um, uh, you know, the park. The, the, oh, they lived in the park down uh, in Charlton Way, um, Stratford Park, uh, Longford Park, that's it. And um, they had a big house there. That house was since demolished by the council uh, back uh, in the 70s. But it was a really beautiful house. And the gardens that you see, it's, ne it's next to where the cafe is um, in Longford Park. The gardens there were part of the gardens of the house. So she was hired into that house. And um, she was, so he loved books and he um, was sort of passionate about books. As a lot of Victorians were at the time, they collected books for the libraries. And she she picked up that passion. She joined it. Uh, she had it herself as well. Um, and she made a number of key purchases where she bought whole libraries of um, various aristocrats. Uh, and so the reason why John Ryland's library on Deansgate today is full of uh, all those really beautiful and actually really quite valuable books now um, is because she made those purchases to uh, go with her husband's collection and um, and uh, then built the library. So I have this sort of lovely picture of um, Enriqueta Ryland sort of walking around, she born, in, born in Cuba, sort of walking around, sort of instructing all these workers, all these builders in building this big library. Um, but again, of course, recognizing that she came, or she married into a wealthy family and that's why she was able to do that. Uh, Martha Partington um, is is known for being one of the 18 victims who died at the Peterloo Massacre. Um, I'll, I'll just sort of summarise brief, briefly. This again was lots of activating um, by uh, people who worked in the factories for better representation um, in government and the right for self-determination. And they uh, marched, they streamed into the city from all over the different areas of, of the city, um, carrying banners peacefully. And the women walked in front uh, a lot in a lot of this. So you imagine the sort of all the different hills around Manchester, all the different towns around Manchester. There were these groups of people who walked in um, and um, women stayed at the front to demonstrate that this was supposed to be peaceful. And then they gathered um, around sort of the Peterloo area, which is where uh, Manchester Conference Centre is now, just near the Midland uh, Library. Um, and they were attacked and a number of them were killed by some soldiers who thought that they um, had been agitating too much. And, and But the, the accounts afterwards in the newspapers were... Um, very condemning of the way that the soldiers had behaved and it actually served uh, as another sort of significant moment in the development of the campaign uh, of the working classes for representation in government. Um, a lot of middle class people were very shocked by how they, uh, how these people had been treated and it started to build this consensus of, of uh, fair representation. Uh, Mary Burns, I like to credit with um, the birth of the idea of socialism, which uh, um, so you probably have heard of Engels and Marx, um, uh, or particularly Marx, who who wrote, um, of course, uh, the, 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 with Engels, but they wrote the seminal text that came, became the sort of foundation of the development of socialism, particularly communism 
in um, which got adopted in in Russia and China in particular, uh, and, and of course over in Cuba. So um, the ideas um, that formed the basis of of that text that Marx wrote. Marx was uh, poor and he was um, sponsored by Engels, who was the son of a wealthy German mill uh, of factory owners. And uh, Engels came over to live in um, Manchester, partly because he was uh, in trouble with his dad for agitating over in Germany, um, because his values were about sort of fair representation. And he um, and Marx spend time in Manchester visiting the um, the various factories, uh, and and so Engels meets Mary. Now Mary's a, a local woman. Um, she's the one who who took him around and showed him um, all the, the 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 various uh, factories and the problems that were going on in them. And I again I have this sort of mental picture of this very passionate woman um, who who he apparently falls in love with her. They stay they stay together. Um, you know, throughout their their lives, um, telling him what was wrong and what how things needed to be done differently, um, and that uh, those ideas uh, probably ended up in the writing of the Kissing of the Working Class, which then went on to create you know be the foundation of um, of, of societies around the world. So um, she might not be credited with this, but uh, there's a strong likelihood that she played a significant role in the development of those ideas. Um, and lastly, lastly, Miss Lala, um, it's hard to find out uh, much about her history here, but what we do know is that uh, she was um, famous for her flying trapeze and human cannon act. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a very famous painting by a French impressionist called Edgar Degas um, of her in the National Gallery. Uh, and she, she spent some time in the Manchester Theatre hanging uh, from the roof uh, by her teeth. So, so these are just a, a collection of some really interesting women. And what uh, we wanted to do was uh, create um, a, a storytelling project using a Kickstarter um, approach. So we um, put out a, a campaign, we developed a whole variety of different offers, and then we didn't raise enough money. So that was the end of the Kickstarter. Uh, and this is what I sort of wanted to share with you was this idea of we found these really interesting women. We want to tell their story. But what do we do? What, what, how do we get someone to pay us to do it? Which is, of course, I'm sure you all know, always the challenge. How do you get someone to pay you to pursue the projects that you're interested in? So we didn't get any money from the Kickstarter. So the next thing that we did was we created an audio trail. Um, using the Echoes app. I'm not sure if um, you've come across this. It's a really interesting free platform where you can create uh, uh, different kinds of uh, audio which you can record on your phone. You can do it in a very sort of simple way. Um, you can record audio on your phone. You go into this platform um, and you create what they call it, or we call it a bubble, which is a little GPS bubble. So you look at a map of an area you record, uh, in, in this case, we um, imagined um, uh, Annie and Miss Lala and, and these different women uh, in the different key locations around the city uh, where, they, where they might have spent time. And we created a little sort of two or three minute narrative uh, and we recorded them and then um, put them into this app so you can download the app and find uh, the story search for Manchester, Ms. Lala, or whatever, Manchester strong women, Victorian Manchester. And is this still available now, Jess? Just checking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. You can. Brilliant. Just check in. People you can, can go look and... for it. It's there. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, so, so we created that trail, um, and that was a sort of another way in which we developed the projects. And from that, actually, we um, were then commissioned, um, and this is the first bit where we actually got paid to do some work in this area. Um, by the Wordsworth Museum to bring um, the story of Dorothy Wordsworth, who wasn't uh, from Manchester. She was up in the Lake District, but uh, she was very much part um, with her brother, William Wordsworth, who's a sort of more famous poet. Um, 
but uh, she wrote a nature journal and it's recently, literally in the past few years, um, the Words of the Museum has come to credit Dorothy with her nature journal being significantly influencing uh, and her herself and her ideas influencing the formation and development of, um, of William Wordsworth's poetry. And we did the same thing again there, we, um, but we did it in a more extensive way where we worked with a, a group of women from the Women's Institute in Grasmere to identify passages within Dorothy's journal. Um, and then we created a walk around Grasmere and we, we dropped, they recorded the passages from Dorothy's journal. It, it, um, we, we had, an, again, a sound artist work with us to, to, to do the recording. So it was a higher quality, but you could have done it on your phone. Um, and then we dropped them in so you couldn't, and, walk around Grasmere and listen to Dor people talking um, about Dorothy's work. So just um, uh, this, to put this into context, at the time I was developing a project around um, augmented reality and, and this idea of content popping up wherever you go. So in that case, it was audio. We also had an app which was um, visual, so you could use your phone to pop up content. Um, and this progressed to an idea around uh, 3D virtual worlds and um, how digital assets might move between um, different realms, whether or not they're visual or audio, and they can be triggered by uh, different images. And so we came up with this whole story concept about um, what we called astrojacks, which were um, people from the future who came back to the past and then we made a whole story and a cartoon strip about uh, these characters coming back to Manchester during World War II um, and witnessing the Blitz. Uh, so, um, and we got a bit of funding again, uh, this time from the government to look into R&D around how to use these ideas in, uh, with blockchain, which was um, a way of tracking assets along different uh, digital contexts. And then now, so what I'm moving into now is how you can use augmented reality, uh, sorry, how you can use artificial intelligence to create stories, um, focusing in particular on ideas around love. Uh, and so my latest project is um, how love poetry can inform the design of the metaverse. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I'll end it there, but that's, I wanted you to kind of see the trajectory of how um, starting with ideas, getting a bit of money to do things, and then how those ideas progress into different um, uh, uh, other projects. It spins into other things, doesn't it? And sometimes there's a bit of, there's always um, either following a passion or doing a lost leader or, you know, creating what tools you can and changing changing the way you storytell based on what, what, what you've got at your disposal and what you find out, really interesting. And I don't know what other people have made of that, but there's women that I've never heard of in Manchester there who I feel like I probably should have done, but um, brilliant stuff and a, an, an opening start to uh, whet our appetite, specifically from, I guess, women based around the Manchester area. Um, and as we move forward, um, most of the women we're going to talk about next are not from that area. So thank you for giving us that bit of context, Jess, and, and starting us off in the place where we're all sort of uh, around and about. Um, Mariana, I think I'm going to invite you up next, if I may, to uh, share a bit about your interest in this topic and some fascinating stuff around, you know, women in Ukraine. Thank you, Nikaila. Thank you, Jessica. It was very interesting. I found out a lot of new information for myself because mm -hmm. I'm comparatively new to the area. I moved to Manchester three years ago and I'm still learning mm -hmm. a lot of things. And um, thank you for, for sharing this information. This is very useful. And if I may, can I ask this um, uh, the presentation to be shared if, yeah, if you possible? Should. Yeah. Oh, you want me to share the one that you sent? Uh, no, no, Je Jessica's one, if, if oh, possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm sure she'll be that. I mean, yeah, yeah. we we have this information, some bits and bobs somewhere, but if if it is gathered in one place, and all your projects are very interesting, so I would like to to, to learn more about that. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll start with introduction of myself. My name is Mariana, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a great honor for me to be here with uh, people who share my ideas and my interests in, in history 
and everything that is happening around the world nowadays and uh, the century we live in. I'm Ukrainian myself and I have been living in the UK for 10 years. This year is going to be 10 years now and um, uh, originally I'm, I was born in Ukraine but I have lived in a couple of countries and uh, I consider myself as a person of the world, which is amazing. And um, uh, currently I'm leading the project called United for Ukraine, uh, which was launched when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine uh, two years ago. We support newly arrived Ukrainians uh, within the governmental restart scheme and as a nonprofit project called United for Ukraine. So we have two different ways of supporting them. And we help them with uh, employment, with the courses, reskilling, upskilling, uh, mental health support, um, and different questions uh, related to that. If we can't help, we know who can help because we are liaising with different um, local authorities, uh, charities, organizations, and uh, we have achieved so many great things so far. We have got uh, 500 job starts in two years. They say it's a great result because people arriving from from uh, the war, they are very eager to work and we are just supporting them into that rather than, than waiting for the war to stop. They want to work and they want to contribute into the economics and they want to to be a part of the society, which is great. And we are very grateful uh, to the United Kingdom government, uh, local authorities, charities, all people of good heart and will who supported Ukraine from the very beginning when the war started. And uh, we are just trying to be useful um, for, for, for all the parties since, since it all began. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to be talking about the change makers and game changers of Ukrainian land, women of Ukrainian land who made significant changes in the history, not only uh, uh, of Ukraine, but also in the history of the world. Uh, I'm very sorry about some sensitive topics I'm going to be discussing, but this is the part of the history and this is the part of the painful game changing in the world so that's why I'll, I'll i'll be touching these questions so i'm gonna share my screen with you uh nikola how do i do that please i'll oh, share screen sorry about that yeah and then you'll yeah, see a yeah. little window you should be able because usually i'm Here working in uh, in teams but yeah. now it's it's on its way you. there you Thank go you. I'm learning with you. So I'm going to be talking about women's movement in Ukraine. And this lady is called Olga Barada, who was heavily wounded and who lost her leg. She was a sniper in the Ukrainian army at the front line. And uh, now she's uh, going through the rehabilitation period and she's going to return to the army when she's fully recovered. Um, Henry Heine, a German poet, said that a woman creates history, although history remembers men, which is true because uh, since uh, uh, the beginning of the world, men played a significant role in all layers of the society, but every man who is a hat was uh, led by a woman who is a neck, which uh, this is what we say in Ukraine, because uh, behind any anything that happened significant in the world uh, stood women. Um, Ukrainian women are a testament to this reality because uh, Ukrainian nation has produced many heroic women throughout its history and Ukrainian women have demonstrated remarkable resilience surviving and fighting in inhumane conditions. They bravely fought for the freedom and democratic values and they are continuing doing this now. Many of them are no longer with us but yet today new heroines are holding rifles so medical kits in their hands instead of flowers or children. Here you got two pictures of the lady from the 19th century who was fighting at the front line and the lady of nowadays who is doing the same even a couple of centuries after that. 
Um, it all started in 1884. Uh, if we talk how the feminism and how women's movement began in Ukraine, uh, uh, it was uh, when Natalia Kobrinska organized the first public meeting of Galician women in Stanislav, which is Western Ukraine. You know that throughout its history, Ukraine was under different rules. It was Polish rule, Austro-Hungarian rule, Russian rule, and the Bolsheviks. But uh, throughout the histories, throughout the centuries, women were just trying to be uh, standing up and to fight for their rights. But only it shaped as a movement in the late 80s, in 1884 and further on. Uh, that was the starting point in the history of the Ukrainian women's movement a bit later than in Europe, because Ukraine was heavily oppressed then. But again, it started then. Um, uh, about 100 women from various Galician towns and villages attended the meeting and officially establish the short-lived society of Ruthenian women. It all began since that time. Uh, 19th century uh, education was heavily banned in Ukraine, uh, which caused the beginning of the all Ukrainian women's movement in Kyiv two years after that, because the more you are restricted, the fiercer the rebellion is. And the Ukrainian women are quite rebellious women, and that's why it has proven to be working uh, when you try to to be against of something. Women in Kyiv, which is the capital of Ukraine, and Kharkiv, this is an ex-capital of Ukraine, established branches of imperial women's organizations, such as the Society of Mutual Aid for Working Women and the Society for Protection of Women. Uh, there was a lady called Christina Alchevska. We've got a town called Alchevsk in uh, southern Ukraine. Um, uh, in her honor, became the major spokesperson for adult education and ran the oldest and largest adult literacy school in Ukraine. Um, there was another um, figure in the Ukrainian history and literature called Lesa Ukrainka, which means a Ukrainian woman. This is a pen name. She's taken for herself and uh, um, she debuted at the age of 13 and she's considered to be one of the first feminists in Ukraine because she was uh, playing against the regime uh, with her poets and with uh, her um taking part in the uh, movement of Ukrainian feminists uh, at these times. Ukrainian lands at these times were divided between Austro-Hungarian and Russian empires. And uh, uh, in Russian empire, where Lesa Ukrainka lived, uh, the very act of writing literature in the Ukrainian language was very risky. Works in Ukrainian had to go through the censorship process in St. Petersburg, which was the uh, capital of Russian empire empire at that time. Translations of world literature into Ukrainian were strictly banned because it was important for the imperial ideology to preserve the status of the Ukrainian language as original dialect, not fit for high culture. Throughout the centuries, Ukrainian language was banned, but it is still alive and it is still developing. Um, this lady, Lysa, was a new woman, a woman of new century, as she was called, uh, and uh, uh, her subject ranged from Homeric Greece to the ancient Middle East of the 17th century, Tsardom of Moscow. And one of my favorite poems is Contra Spam Sparrow, uh, which means without hope, I hope. And yes, I will laugh despite my tears. I'll sing out songs amidst my misfortunes. I'll have hope despite all odds. I will live away your sorrowful thoughts. And even now in the times of challenges, I'm just repeating these lines for myself. And this is one of the reasons to, to help me to keep going and moving. While we are talking about some um, uh, women's uh, movements and taking parts in the liberation movements during the world wars in the history of Ukraine, they did take part a lot and they did take uh, played leading roles uh, throughout the battlefield. Um, this is one of the one of the most uh, favorite uh, ladies, uh, Olena Stepaniu. She said, I considered it my duty towards the Ukrainian people. 
to fight for its freedom, to fight for its sovereignty, to fight for democratic values. At the beginning of the 20th century, Ukrainians were spoken of as people rising from the ashes. In 1914, Ukrainian women for the first time in history joined the official military forces. Uh, they earned officer ranks, commanded men, and received awards for bravery officially, which is a very significant um, way to establish themselves as a, a right as person uh, in this fight, people in this fight. We were not entirely aware of what work women should do in times of war, but we understood we had to be everywhere according to abilities, goodwill, and eagerness. This is what she said. She was Ukrainian historian, lecturer, public and military figure. Uh, she was the first woman enlisted in military service with the rank of officer. And she served as a junior officer in the Ukrainian Galician army. And then she joined the Legion of Ukrainian Siege Riflemen and participated in the military campaign of 1915 as lieutenant. After being captured, she organized the November uprising of 1918 and actively participated in the Polish-Ukrainian war. Um, we had a lot of different uh, movements for rights of women even during in between world uh, times. One of the largest feminist organization in Europe was founded in the 20s, in 1920s, in modern day Western Ukraine, Galicia. Uh, their organization was called the Union of Ukrainian Women and it was led by the lady called Milena Rudnetska. And during the Soviet era, feminism was classified as a bourgeois ideology and therefore considered anti-Soviet counter-revolutionary. Civil society and feminism practically did not exist during Soviet times. After Ukraine gained independence in 1991, the feminist movement began again. Uh, when we are talking about the uh, Second World War, there were a lot of ladies who took part actively in the fight for independence, uh, facing challenges and facing enemies at the battlefield. One of them was a lady called Yevdokiya Zavali. She was called Mrs. Black Death. She was a platoon commander in the Marine Corps with the rank of guard colonel. Uh, women who stood in defense of their country inscribed many glorious pages in the chronicles of war. History had not witnessed such massive participation of women in the armed struggle for the motherland until the women fighting against Nazism showcased it. So this is one of the most famous figures during the world war in the female world. Also, um, Ukrainian um, uh, battalion called Nine Wit Night Witches, uh, uh, women who served in the 46th Guard Taman Female Night Bomber Aviation Regiment. Uh, and uh, they were uh, uh, fighting for independence against Nazism as well. When we are talking about um, anti-Soviet resistance after the World War II uh, on the territory of Ukraine was operating the Ukrainian insurgent army, uh, which sounds like Ukrainska Postanska Armia, Ukrainian's People Army. Um, and that was a movement of nationalist partisan formation against the Soviet Union in the western regions of the Ukrainian SSR during and after the World War II. I want to bring your attention to people who were serving as liaisons. These people were um, hidden connectors in between the army and the different battalions. They were passing different messages. They were passing different kinds of weapons in between the battalions, usually at night. And uh, they usually were living in some hidden places in the woods, uh, hiding and doing their duty for the fight of freedom during these times. So they served as intermediaries between the UPA and Ukrainian underground resistance, supplying them with information and uh, engaging more and more people people into the fight for freedom. They did not have any military ranks or official status, and they risk their lives no less than soldiers and sometimes even more. And usually when captured, they faced a martyr's death. And uh, the 
very important duty was to pass the information, which was vital for some of the um, moments of this war. And um, a very difficult history of my family, of my heritage, is a story of my grandparents and my aunt, who is my grandma's sister. They were uh, liaisons. They were serving as liaisons uh, were in between different battalions of UPA. And um, this is my um, aunt called Irena Shiny. That was her pen name because usually when they were uh, living in uh, hidden circumstances, they did not uh, use their real names. And uh, um, she was operating in the Western Ukraine and uh, she was passing a lot of different information. Her, the story of her youth was very tragic because she was captured once, she was tortured and she could not have children after that. She was married and she lived happily married life, but she couldn't have children after, after she has been through this. Talking about my grandparents, um, their names are Roman and Maria, Roman Rebel and Maria Star. These are their pen names. My grandpa was captured for his activities and he was sent to Siberia for the whole life uh, sentence. But then uh, he was um, uh, condemned to death, but then he managed to escape that. And when the regime fought, he was back to the Western Ukraine where he met my grandma. They were operating at the same time, a couple of miles away from each other, but they, they didn't know each other after that. And when he was back from Siberia five years after he met my grandma, and this is how they married. And they were all together fighting for the freedom, for the independence of Ukraine as much as they could after Siberian uh, sentence, my grandpa could not uh, serve in the army. His health deteriorated greatly and uh, he was just trying to contribute to what was going on and do what, what he can. After that, he uh, they had uh, two kids. This, this is my dad, the, the, the youngest one. And uh, my uh, aunt died when she was five years old in the accident, the car accident. And um, um, they lived a good life um, after that, but they never, when I was a child, they never talked about the war and what they've been through. Only when I was about 10, 11 years old, they started talking about what was going on in Ukraine then, how people were tortured, how people were captured, how people were uh, put in their heads and lives uh, for the fight of the freedom. And something like that is happening now in uh, in Ukraine, um, we have a lot of women, a woman of power, a woman of willpower who are fighting with men uh, uh, at the front line. And we have, uh, as per November 2023, 159,100 women serving in the armed forces of Ukraine. When the uh, regular army services of Ukraine is about 400,000. So if you look at the figure, it's about one third, even more women serving at the front line. They work as snipers, as uh, just soldiers, or even as colonels. I do know some women who are serving as colonel in the Ukrainian army now. So it is very hard. It is very challenging. Uh, but we have proven that the women of power can fight for the independence, for the rights of the women, because it's not only the fight for the uh, rights of the women, it's fight for, for everything in the world. And uh, the, the modern fight is going on and we take part in this. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you, I'm Maria. getting yourself back somehow. Stop share. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm very, back uh, to very... you. Thank you. Very That's emotional. Good. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, no, I was a bit surprised. emotional, but this is the life I live. Absolutely. And what a, what a, you know, heartfelt and very sort of candid story of, 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 you know, Ukrainian women past and present really, and uh, very illuminating and very uh, humbling, I guess, to see the journey of, of, of the Ukrainians and it's still playing out and it's still rolling on and it's still being of huge importance to all of us now. So um, great, great to have that perspective, and I'm sure there'll be 
thoughts and questions as the session sort of rolls on there and yes i've been tweeting away because it's just really important um to get to get this information out and for us all to better grasp you know all of our history and 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 the history that affects us so thank you um follow that Soraya <laughs> I'm kidding oh, I know what you are but uh, you've got an equally uh, you know illuminating tale of a, a different side of the world you know not least your own journey and your own sort of uh, interest in this topic but I know that you're potentially going to take us uh, on a bit of a tale to uh, South Africa so um, over to you yeah I am thank you so much by the way because I was I'm very ignorant of most of what you shared there um and uh, it's about time that we all understood better um the struggle for women that women have had there really eye-opening um thank you to flourish for inviting us all to have this important important conversation and uh, it's nice to be part of it and also uh, ramadan blessings and peace to everybody today the first day of ramadan for us um so i might be sipping at my milk as we go Please do. <laughs> uh, so yeah i want to tell us a story that will transport us back in time not too far so we're going to go to 2012 first of all which for you, you may remember was the um, year of the London Summer Olympics. Feels like decades and decades ago, but yeah, it was 2012. Uh, then the 1980s, which was of course the age of neon and Nintendo. And um, then we'll go to the 1880s. Um, and at that time for us in Victorian Britain, um, as Jessica will know far better than I, um, women had little access to education. We didn't have the vote, but we did have corsets. And apparently overlacing your corset could give you anemia. <laughs> so yeah, that will go back to 1880s very briefly, but we're gonna go on a journey from Manchester to Cape Town, Johannesburg, then Tennessee, and then Stockport. <laughs> so uh, I'll start sharing. Hopefully it'll let you. Yeah, brilliant. It's coming through. <laughs> okay, so um oh, it's not going to full screen. It's down at the bottom of your screen is like a little um if you want to, it's up to you. Down at the bottom of your screen that one. there'll be a there you go, or the top. Yeah, there's a few ways to do it. Over to you. Okay, so in 2012, I found myself producing and directing a TV series. I had been born in Manchester, grew up here and made my way into TV through the BBC here in Manchester. And in 2012, I had the privilege of um, spending a year um, following change makers from across Africa who'd been selected to um, experience leadership training um, with the Archbishop Tutu Leadership Fellowship. So it was my job to cast five of them as the lead characters in my series and we filmed them in their home countries and we filmed them as they arrived for their training and we followed their, their journeys. Um, and that culminated in them meeting Archbishop Desmond Tutu himself. So in 2012, it was Glorious year, Cape Town was absolutely roasting. It was beautiful, stunning scenery. And we, I, um, I said to myself, well, I've never been around change makers before. Um, I've, I'd filmed uh, the stories of other change makers and I, but I didn't, certainly didn't relate to, relate to that title myself and had this idea that I'd never actually been around any before. So I was really excited and I was very, very much aware of the privilege of what I was doing. It's probably one of the best years of my life professionally. But I, what I didn't realize was that being a fly on the wall in those rooms would really, really alter the course of my life later on. Um, so I was researching the, the speakers that were coming and one of them was one of the female leaders of the anti-apartheid movement. 
Tutu's Children, by the way, is the name of the series and you can find it um, on um, YouTube. Um, I'll share a link afterwards if you're interested in having a look. So I'd spotted, yes, that one of the anti, obviously Archbishop Tutu being one of the leading male figures and Nelson Mandela as well. Um, but then there was this name of, um, uh, let me get it correct, Manfela Ramfele. And she was one of the speakers who was going to be addressing these young African leaders. So as I was researching her, it really took me back to my childhood. And if any of you were here in the 1980s, I don't know whether some of you are way too young to remember 1980s, but I think for a child growing up at that time, seeing the coverage of the anti-apartheid movement, it was probably the first time that you grasped the fact that people could have that significant a change on their destiny um, and a voice and be determined to have that voice regardless of the brutality that they faced. So it, it had um, made a big impact on me as a child. Um, and then I was just absolutely over the moon to be able to be in the room with, with one of the female leaders. So, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, but, but then isn't it interesting that the female leaders are, are very rarely mentioned? So here she is, Manfela Ramfele, and um, throughout her talk, she spoke about this notion of everyday leadership and it really altered my understanding of what leadership is. Um, everyday leadership is this kind of universalizing notion that you don't need to be bestowed with a title. You don't need any kind of external validation to know that you're a leader. It's a mindset. And, and she was very much trying to impress that upon these young people, these young change makers in the room, all from different countries across Africa, all with different ideas of how they would uh, make a difference to their communities and their societies. And um, she was explaining that it's a mindset and you want to role model change in sometimes in small ways so that other people can see that they can do it too. Um, and it's how you treat people, it's how you speak, um, and it's how you perhaps think more than do, perhaps more reflective, perhaps you listen more than you talk. Um, so these were the notions of what leadership, or the definition of leadership that she was talking about. And the people were absolutely, obviously spellbound because they knew far more about her. They'd grown up with her being a figure um, of history, really. And so as she was speaking, um, I could very much tell that she was having a huge impact on them. There was a, you could hear a pin drop in the room. And she was trying to tell them that she wasn't much different to them or to anyone else and that their daily reality, she actually was a medical student. That's how um, she got involved in uh, how she became a change maker. She was a medical student at the time, obviously in those times of extreme segregation and oppression. And um, she decided that with her qualification, she was going to set up community clinics where people were, you know, black people were not getting adequate medical attention. And that's what she did. So she was trying to convey this message that she was just an ordinary person and we, we were, you know, every day, we could be everyday leaders as well. Um, and it, 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 she was saying she was almost an accidental leader. And it was just that her situation evolved into something so huge and so grotesque grotesque in a way that they ended up being the leaders of this huge movement that was known about from in all corners of of the world but that that was not never her intention um but in fact she also what she didn't speak about which I looked into later was she was um the long-standing partner of Steve B 
Biko. And you might know Steve Biko from a film at the time, Cry Freedom, played by Denzel Washington. So Steve Biko is like considered to be one of the key strategists of the anti-apartheid movement. And they also call him the father of black consciousness. So if you, uh, you know, if you are aware of black history, uh, he's a very key figure. And she was, he, not to um, heroize him, however, he, he, the gender politics were not ideal. So she was his longtime partner. He had many. Uh, he was well known as um, a womanizer and um, that's what they called him but he had they had two children together and they never married but she was by his side for most of the um most critical years of the anti-apartheid movement and they worked together on the rights on fighting for the rights that 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 um were given you know such such low regard in the country at the time and um, but she did say that, you know, although she was on a grassroots level having such a huge impact, her and the other women at the at the at the forefront of that movement, um, in their private lives, the men in the organizations, they were, you know, they wouldn't even make themselves a cup of tea. It was the women who did all the cleaning and the organizing and the cooking and so on. And that was just that was the status quo. So it's not to heroize um these men but um but to say that you know the women had fights let's shall we say on on many fronts at the same time as women as black women um as change makers and certainly it, with with the gender politics of their own organizations and the men that they uh, that led them so Back in that room, you can see on the right hand side, that's a very poorly taken photo from behind the scenes of filming the series. So there she is, this woman who, you know, on, on the face of it, I shouldn't identify with. I, you know, I don't have anything in common with her incredible story. Um, but suddenly something happened that none of us expected. So as we sat there, we were just wrapping up. She was wrapping up her talk about everyday leadership. And um, all of a sudden something burst the bubble. Um, someone stood up and took the microphone, one of the, one of the participants we were following in the series. And she was a Kenyan journalist, young woman. And it was really clear immediately that, that this, she wasn't going to ask a question. She had something to say and her voice was choked and she was trembling. She took the microphone and um, the camera panned and caught the whole thing on camera. So it was in the series. But basically she said, you know, everything you're saying sounds great, but to be a change maker, is it necessary to sacrifice ourselves? Is it necessary for me to face death threats? Is it necessary for my children to wonder whether I'm coming home each day? Do I have to sacrifice my well-being to to make a difference? Um, and she was she was really choked, and she was you know on the verge of tears. And Manfela Manfela Ramfele took her time to respond. Uh, so as we were all waiting, kind of holding our breaths, um, what you should know is that she actually lost the love of her life to the cause that they were fighting. So um, Biko was beaten in custody and died from mass massive spinal um, hemorrhage, aged just 30 years old. So she knew about sacrifice in that sense. But what she said, the five words she said next were just like, stuck in my mind and have been ever since. She said these words to this young woman. She said, we lift as we climb. And she explained that what she meant by that was that if you are lucky enough to be in a position where you do not have to sacrifice yourself and you can also look after your own family 
and your own well-being and your own fortunes as well as make a difference then do both those things don't always have to be mutually exclusive and she was comforting that young change maker and saying you can still make a difference you don't always have to put yourself directly in danger um, or suffering um, what she said was that for a better future um, it needs to be possible for some people to to step up to life as well and endure and show communities how to thrive um, and she said you are a mother and that is your automatic leadership position right the moment your child is born you're a leader and I remember thinking at the time yeah it's really you know it was really impactful really emotional and very impressive and I thought to myself I'll just remember that slogan but I still didn't really apply it to me so I'll just stop sharing a moment while I tell you the next part so years later I was definitely personally and professionally at a huge crossroads. I felt very disillusioned with um, how easily people were discriminated against in some scenarios in, in this country. And I'd also, it's the first time that I'd faced prejudice. So I'm talking about in my mid thirties um, and it was having a huge impact on my well-being. I'd grown up um, in a mixed race family. I'd never experienced racism. I didn't believe in Islamophobia growing up. I didn't believe in any of those things. And there I was in my mid thirties, suddenly um, in, a, in a professional setting, experiencing these things. And I was totally thrown. I was completely thrown by it. And it had a massive impact on my well-being. And I was looking for inspiration on how do I get through this? I want to actually make a difference for others. I want to actually have an a positive change for others. And I can't even look after myself in this situation. Um, I was probably quite embarrassed and ashamed about that as well at the time. So I started to, inside of myself, search for examples of women who'd navigated that, that road. Um, and the words came back to me, um, those five words, we lift as we climb. So it reminded me, I don't necessarily have to keep putting myself in harm's way in a situation that is detrimental to me becoming someone who can help others. And so that got, that led me into thinking, hold on a minute, where did that phrase come from? Because she'd actually shared with us that it, she'd borrowed the phrase from other women in history. So then I got really curious and I thought, okay, where did this phrase come from? I'm just going to share again. And what I discovered took me back to the 1880s in America. So basically, it was this woman, Mary Church Carroll, who founded basically one of the first civil rights organizations in the US. And it was the National Association of Colored Women. She had been born, so I discovered she'd been born the child of slaves, but her family became, went into business and they became very, very successful, wealthy businessmen, business people and one of the um, richest African-American families in America at the time. So she grew up mixed race, just as I did. Um, she was one of the first African-American women to get a degree. And she used her education and her standing to fight for the rights and the voice for other black women who at that time were marginalized, were segregated and powerless in many situations. But she also fought for the right for women to vote. So she was she was an activist in two respects. 
for women's rights and the right to vote suffrage and also civil rights of black women. Um, she had faced sexism even in, um, so she'd faced sexism as many women, obviously women did in, in the status that they had in the US at the time, but she'd also at the same time faced racism um, even within the suffrage movement she spoke about having faced racism and she was one of the earliest she was one of America's first anti-lynching activists um, and she did everything she could I mean she she really has decades of um, story stories if you look into what she did the way that she organized or you know brought organizations together to actively um, offer opportunity, uh, very much like, you know, we've heard today um, with United for Ukraine in terms of uplifts into work, into uh, meaningful roles in society. And um, the motto they used, the National Association of Coloured Women, they coined this motto, we lift as we climb. In other words, that see when you see your own privilege, whatever that is, however small, however big, when you see that you have privilege and you have power, you use that um, for the benefit of, of others who don't. Um, just one thing I would mention about her before um, I finish talking about her, here she is with Lifting As We Climb banner and um, she, in her, in, in, with that motto and in, inspired by her, Many, many black women's organizations have been established across America. Um, so she really was a, a, a major kind of um, game changer. But she one concept that I really related to when I went on this deep dive into where did this slogan come from was this idea of interconnectedness. So in other words, that the uplift of women was connected to the uplift of black pe black women that um that paving the way for black women was not just the job of black women that it was uh, all of us could do that and that that black women should also be interested in the rights of women so it's this idea of um inequality and loss of voice and loss of agency to be um one loss and that by unifying you can tackle all those oppressions together. Um, and obviously that more power in, in uh, unifying. And when I, so yeah, that's when I kind of thought about this idea of solidarity. She said, uh, she used to say, stand up not only for oppressed women, but also the oppressed race. And I think that the the legacy of that one phrase, because obviously they were thinking in the context of their struggle and coined that phrase. And it had then many, many years later inspired the women leading the South African anti-apartheid movement. Then we'd, we, we discovered it and all these change makers from across Africa had discovered it in that room. I'd brought it back with me to Manchester and it was there for me at a time when I felt very, very lost and very disconnected. I'd been living overseas and then came home, but home was not the same home politically uh, in terms of the inequalities I saw and faced. And um, it gave me a huge amount of comfort. So I went on a deeper dive into other women. And in fact, when we're talking about heritage, I found a, I, there weren't many Arab or mixed race Arab British women I could look to for that guidance or for that inspiration. Their stories are not known. Their stories are not known. It was black women and also black women such as Michelle Obama and her book, um, uh, Becoming. There's some powerful words in there for women who feel lost and looking to contribute how to contribute when you are yourself enduring different struggles of identity. And, and also I discovered Maya Angelou and her words. Um, so I started to return to this idea of language 
language that just even a five word phrase having such a huge impact and profound impact on countless people throughout time uh, and you know that kind of brings us so these are sorry some of the legacies of the phrase lift as you climb people have written books about so wait, women I'm in to check um just because i know we've got michaela to, to to speak as well just how how much more of your presentation there is just so this is the, this is the end this I, thought, is the... I thought i thought i hate i didn't want to look because it's all i mean gosh i'm taking it all in and i'm just yes. these words and the the the, the just the consideration that you've given to 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 this work and what you've been doing and, and that journey that you're taking you on, you know, is, is is fab. So carry on as you are, and then Michaela will warm herself up. We have mentioned that we may wrap up slightly early, but you know, chance of that's going out the window. But that's absolutely fine because everything that we're hearing is really rich and really powerful. So um, continue as you are, and um, yeah, to explain this this the, these last sort of uh, sections you've been thinking. Yeah, I mean, this is just to say how influential that one phrase was. And it's if if you look at how it's had a, a massive impact on um on the world of rights and social change in America. I mean, it's inspired art, it's inspired murals, it's inspired books. Um, you can even get um, you know, social so, social justice artwork as a um inspired by that phrase as well. So when um when I started to look at the women who'd coined this phrase and obviously um the movement that they'd they'd established with this phrase, it really was a journey into somebody else's heritage. And I think that that is something I'd like to, you know, just flag really that we don't we we can obviously we gain so much from looking into our own heritage, but we can also take from each other's um, and in Greater Manchester in 2024 and beyond, what I would invite you all to do is to reflect on this. A couple of notions really, just to wrap up. First of all, this idea of everyday leadership. And I'd said to myself when I turned up in Cape Town, I've never been around change makers before. But reflecting on that, I started to see that I'd always had women leaders all around me. My grandmother, who did a lot for her community. Um, it might be a teacher or a family friend. Uh, and I've, I've come to the realization that we don't need to look just to the heroines. It is about where we're at already and the people around us. Um, the second thing I would like to invite your reflection on is, um, how our words can carry power and how we can show solidarity through our words and our language. Um, what words can we leave as a legacy to others? And the final thing is the phrase lift as you climb has been so massively important to me and to other people. What does it mean to you? And does it give you any insight or comfort into your own change maker journeys? And that's where I'm. Wow. Lots and lots of food for thought there. And yeah, powerful, powerful uh, things to leave us with as we sort of start to, to invite uh, Michaela to, to, to come forward. But heaps in there, heaps to go at. Uh, I think the chances of us getting into breakouts with the time and everything else is pretty impossible. But I also think tonight was always going to be a um, conversation starter and I'm already thinking about oh we need to do this and we need to do that and you know it'd be you know the, the invitation's there a to think about what Soraya's just said you know to take on board things that my rayana has been saying and <laughs> and also Jess at the start I think this what what I've been tweeting about is that there's there's so much kind of rich knowledge and insight through our networks on this sort of theme that you know we've really got to delve a bit deeper in exploring some of this um, and so you know, we'll we'll reflect on that briefly before we we end up wrapping up this evening. But um, before we do, we're gonna go to a, another part of the world, or we're here in the UK, but actually <laughs> um, looking at some Irish heritage uh, with our Michaela, <laughs> who's been very excited with the the tool of, of ancestry that she's been uh, grappling with for a number of kind of months now. So um, now for something completely different, <laughs> yet again. <laughs> 
Hi everyone, uh, it's great to be here and it's been fascinating so far and thank you for everything that everyone shared. Um, so I'm talking about my ancestors, which I was told about by my granddad when I was 13 years old. Now he told me when I was learning about this, the suffragettes over here. And basically Anna Parnell was an upper class um, Protestant in Ireland in the late 1800s. And back then in Ireland, it was, you could kind of say it was kind of like an apartheid in a way, because if you were a Catholic, you didn't really have any rights. You couldn't own any land. They took the land away from them. And Anna kind of grew up in poverty because her dad died quite young. And she was actually influenced by her, her mom, who was American, and her granddad, uh, Charles, Captain Charles Stuart Parnell, he was actually a war hero in the Navy when he was fighting Britain. He captured two ships and he actually fought um, the Atlantic slave check trade and saved lots of young children and took them to Freetown, etc. So I think she kind of had that kind of drummed into her from a young age, if that makes sense. And then on the Parnell side, um, they lived in Ireland, but they were originally from England, and they actually came over from Normandy with the Battle of Normandy. They were like knights that helped them defraud the king. But anyway, we'll go back to the Parnell granddad, William, and his granddad, he was actually compassionate towards what was happening to the Catholic people, and he was an MP, etc. and he tried fighting for them as well. So they had a reputation, the Parnells, of always trying to step up. So not only do we have the dynamics of the women, it's the men as well. And I totally agree, the women seem to be written out of history where the men are celebrated. And this is something that happened to Anna. So her brother Charles, who was known, uh, sorry, I've got some books here. I didn't do a presentation because I'm still researching. That was a brother Charles. He was a sheriff, an MP, and um, he actually became the leader of the Men's Land League. So as an MP, he was fighting for home rule. So I think because their one of their granddads, William Tudor, which was their great Nana Tudor's dad, he was actually um, a general, an attorney general when um, with, um, with oh, what's he called? I'm no good at history. Mm -hmm. It was one of the first presidents, um, George Washington, and he was kind of in that kind of army helping them with that side of stuff. So we have all this coming down. So I think that was their influence for wanting freedom for the Irish people away from being basically a colony to the British Empire. And um, they'd been they'd been through the um the potato famine and obviously a lot of lives were lost, a lot of people emigrated. And this happened when uh, Anna was a baby. So she never kind of lived through that, but she kind of would have heard stories, etc., about what happened. So when uh, Charles was part of uh in part of the men's land league. The Men's Land League was set up to help the tenant farmers because they couldn't own any land and and basically they lived in poverty. They'd had some bad crops. They couldn't afford the rent, barely afford food. And the absentee Protestant landlords were racking up the rents. And it got that way. They stepped up and they were like, no, this isn't going to happen. And Charles went to America and because obviously he was kind of known because of his granddad. It enabled him to campaign and crowdsource money from the Irish Americans and they sent the money back to help this campaign. So after a while, the Men's Land League, they knew they were going to be put in prison. So basically they became political prisoners. Um, the Men's Land League was, League was outlawed and they were all thrown in prison. So Michael Davitt, who actually started the Men's Land League, could see this was going to happen. And because Anna and Fanny at this point were in America. Um, Anna had helped a sister Fanny set up the I uh, the American Women's, well, Ladies' Land League, but it's kind of intermittent as Women's Land League as well. But the uh, American Land League, the ladies' one, they were crowdsourcing the money to help the child. So at this point, Michael Davitt turned around and suggested to the Men's Land League that they let Anna set up 
a ladies' land league in Ireland. And at that time, they were like, oh, we don't know, you know, these women, they're not really, they shouldn't really be doing things like this, you know, because the second class women couldn't own property or anything like that. But Anna was very political minded. She used to sit in the ladies' cage at, um, when a brother was um, in Parliament in London, and she used to take notes and do artwork, etc. And she helped her brother that way. So she was kind of the backbone for them. So they agreed to kind of let her do it. But they were like, just hold the line. We want you to kind of look after the paperwork, collect donations, this, that, and the other. And Anna being Anna, she was like, no, we're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to achieve our goals. So basically, Anna stepped up. Um, she set it up. She went round Ireland rallying the women. And back then, like I mentioned, the women were second-class citizens. They'd never done anything political. They weren't even allowed to vote. And she went round saying, no, you have to be self-sufficient. And we're going to start doing uh, basically peaceful and constitutional activism. We're going to help the tenants by providing them advice on what they have to do. If they're going to be evicted, this, that, and the other. They kept what was known as their book of Kells. They were that organised. They had the names and addresses of all these tenants that were going to be evicted. And Anna would actually turn up herself and fight these evictions. And when the, vic the evictions failed, the money they crowdsourced, the women, they were phenomenal. They actually paid the carpenters and bought the wood for tiny homes to be built for these families that were evicted. So back then when they evic were evicted, they were basically left in a ditch to die. The, you know, complete destitution. It was game over. So not only did they provide temporary housing for these people, they fed them as well. They were feeding the men that were basically in a luxurious prison. They were allowed the friends to come and see them. It wasn't like what the women, when they were arrested and put in prison for, they, they were just treated completely differently. So anyway, this carried on. They did a better job. The men were like, mm, okay, they're doing all right. We're not really happy about this. So then Charles from prison decided no, we're going to stop now uh, paying all the rent and we're going to do it so it's called the point of the bayonet. So at this point, they hadn't fore forewarned the women and it was dumped on Anna. So Anna had no choice but to do that. So they weren't paying the rent and the backlash was terrible, but not at the women, at the men. Um, but they, they saved all these people. But sadly, Charles kind of went against them and in prison he agreed to a treaty. And part of that treaty was that the Women's Land League would need to be disbanded and the Men's Land League. Now, Anna was against that. And she said, no, if we, if we pull together, if we just pull together and we keep persevering, we, we can do this. But unfortunately, the men didn't like it because the women were doing a better job than them. And basically, they, they got a bit cheeky as well, the men. And they were like, well, we'd like you to kind of step back, Anna, and start behaving and will you do like the paperwork for us and carry carry on crowdsourcing the money? And she realized then that they were using her and she didn't like that. And she said she was basically, no, either we go for it and we do it or we're not doing it at all. So then her and her brother fell out big time. They never spoke again. Um, Charles was released from prison and he carried on campaigning. Um, he was doing quite well, but then it came out he was apparently having an affair with a married woman, which he wasn't. They'd been together for like years, had three children, but her husband would not give her a divorce because he wanted her inheritance and he was blackmailing them, etc. So when the auntie died, um, the auntie was very clever and left her basically an allowance to live on. And because her husband couldn't get this money, he was like, give me an extortionate amount of money to keep my mouth shut. And they're like, we don't have it. We sunk all our money into helping everyone. So they were like, it was like, okay. So he went to the Tories, told them, and he went to the press. And it basically ended his career. Um, everyone turned against him. That was it. The campaign was all over. Uh, that, that basically what they were doing kind of split apart. Um, then, unfortunately, Anna's sister, uh, Fanny, died suddenly in America, and she was devastated. And it was made worse because then the men basically accused Anna of misusing the money. And Anna was like, no, I'm not having that. We've used the money correctly. We didn't put it away for your campaign, but we've saved all these people's lives. And that's kind of where they fell out. And um, so then 
Charles kind of left. He went to um to Brighton, um, and then he found they finally managed to get a divorce, and he got married, and then he passed away. And then shortly after that, Anna's mum Delia, who was living in America, unfortunately she was attacked and left for dead. And she came back to Ireland, and then unfortunately, from what I've read, the fireplace there was a back wind at their ancestral home at Avondale. And she was set, set on fire and passed away, unfortunately. So then this was in 1910. So then Anna got an inheritance and she left Ireland. She 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 just left and she ended up in Devon. And she kept in contact with the women from the Ladies Land League. She was in complete poverty and they helped her a few times. She wrote a letter of support to help the first woman ever be nominated to become like an MP, a member of parliament. Um, and then, unfortunately, she drowned in the ocean in Devon. Her, her funeral was like, it just went like no one knew. Yet when her brother died, he was brought back from Brighton to Ireland. They did a massive parade. The people lined the street. He was uh, buried in Glasnevin Cemetery, which is like a very famous cemetery. Um, he has a monument. He has um, Ivy Day every year. Um, and Anna didn't get any of that. And then Michael Davitt, when she was alive, he turned against her and wrote a book. And Anna wrote a manuscript, which I have here, uh, which I'm about to read. And it's a historic mem memoir, and nobody would publish it within her lifetime. They were adamant she was not going to get her side of the I think, story. I think we want bedtime story with Michaela. And we want yeah, to yeah. <laughs> but um, she <laughs> finally, after her death, finally got published. And then, I mean, I mentioned kind of what my granddad told me to my lecture in 2017 when we were looking up civic movements and social movements. And I mentioned, oh, my granddad told me this. And she's like, oh, look into it. And that's when I quickly kind of looked into it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is a real type thing. Oh, my God, this is amazing. And um, at that time, obviously, I was busy with, it, with like doing my degree. I didn't have a lot of time to carry on looking. And then recently I looked into it again and I thought, oh, well, go on X and type in on the panel and see if anything pops up. And then I came across a post by a lady called Lucy. I cannot pronounce her surname. And she'd been over to the Parnell Society, one of their summer schools, and they were actually talking about Anna Parnell. And she decided to come over from Ireland to go over to Devon. And she spent four hours with her husband looking for Anna's grave. They found Anna's grave. It was derelict. Um, a sister, Emily, after she found out she died, she paid for a two, like a headstone for her. So basically, she came back to Ireland, started telling the Parnell Society. She told Margaret Ward, who's like a historian that has written about Anna, which she's kind of, she's given me some information, some amazing books I'm going to read. And there's now a campaign to bring Anna home to Ireland. Um. So I found out about that through Lucy and it was because of my conversations with Lucy and finding out that I could write a letter to the Irish Parliamentary Women's Caucus, a letter of support and asking, can we please bring Anna's body home to her beloved island? And I wrote that letter and I was quite surprised. I got um, an email back asking if they could enclose my letter uh, to be sent to the diocese in Devon, where she was interned, and fingers crossed, that'll be the first step. So basically what I am wanting to do now, because this is why I've decided to become public, my mission now is to get Anna home and get her to get the credit she, she deserves. Because of the, as a 13-year-old girl, I didn't understand all the political side of things. What hit me the most was the fact that she inspired all these women that were set second class citizens that weren't even allowed to vote to step up and take action that basically stopped a genocide of people. And that her lasting legacy and their lasting legacy are the subsequent lives that have been born. Now, if that is not something worth celebrating and something we should be remembering her for, I don't know what else is. And I did even ask the the, the women's calculus, if they're able to do a monument, not to just do it about Anna, but to please include Anna, Fanny, Delia, the Women's Land League and the people that were saved. Because Anna 
in her lifetime, it wasn't about her. It wasn't like, I'm the big I am. I'm, I'm a lady. It wasn't like that. She used her power to help others. And to her, it was about them all coming together and what they could achieve. So I think, you know, for me, a monument, I think it'd be nice to have, like, it kind of summarised. Yeah, you can have one passionate person who's dedicated that can make a difference. But if we all work together, just imagine what we could achieve. Mm -hmm. So, let's, yeah. Let's get on a home. So I'm kind of where's on that, my... Where's one day, next day? Day? If anybody <laughs> wants to connect with me and help me figure out a project, I have editing skills, I can make videos. Um, but right now, I'm still on the research side, and I'm not just saying that I have, I have like, books like books that are hundreds of years old. You aren't going to sleep for a while there. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's crazy because the more I'm researching the family, the stories my granddad are telling that he told me, I'm finding a true. Like one of my favourite stories about Anna was when she found out there was going to be an eviction. Now, bear in mind back then they used to wear the really long dresses and everything. So she used to wear like the walking dress. She was more very casual. She wasn't into the dressing up and the high life. She she didn't really like that. And there was a bridge and they wouldn't let her across the bridge to stop this eviction. So she was like, is there a gentleman here that I can jump on your back and you will swim with me across this river? And she did. And she got across that river and she played hell and she stopped <laughs> that eviction. And I was like, wow, I love this woman. And then I was told my middle name, Anne, is after Anna. My sister's middle name, Catherine, is after Anna as well. And my brother's called John, after our ancestral granddad, who was Anna's brother. Mm -hmm. But it's just amazing. It's just history, the moral yeah. learning. History repeat, yeah. may repeat itself in terms of uh, some uh, high-profile uh, change-making. Who knows? Well, yeah. Thank you for sowing a seed with all of that. And again, more food for thought on the, on a what next. Um, I'm yeah. pretty that's that people may you know we've we've heard four very different but hopefully very inspiring presentations and uh, yeah I wasn't quite sure where all this would lead and, and I still don't know and we've not got long to sort of think but I'm more than happy to sort of uh, create a follow-up event to just come back with thoughts ideas and other stories because there's no doubt people on this call who this has perhaps evoked thoughts for them about their own families or their oh. own interests and uh, I just wonder in the little bit of time we've got, whether people have got any any particular any any questions or or, or anything. There was one that in the chat here, and I couldn't answer it because I just don't know. But you mentioned something about a, a women's cage. It was something. Oh, the ladies' cage. Ladies' cage. So what in ladies Parliament, cage? back then, the women were not allowed in Parliament. So, what Charles used to do to kind of drive them insane and slow down them being able to implement things, he'd just give very long speeches. So Anna, what she'd do, the ladies' cage was like a room where you could kind of see in and watch everything that was happening. So a few times they threw, they threw Charles out and Charles didn't mind. He was like, I'll just go and chill in the ladies' cage with my sister and we'll just like make a plan of action. But yeah, that's what the ladies' cage was. But Anna and Fanny, they used their art of poetry to raise awareness of what was happening as well. They both had aliases. I think as we well. need to see some of these poems at some point. I think we need. Yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking. Like we need a follow up on everybody's session. You know, be it you know uh, Mariana's, yours, Jess's, Soraya's, as a kind of follow on kind of action planning session, or kind of a what next for each one really, um, in terms of you know the inspiration that is evoked and the um, mm -hmm. you know potential. I I would I would invite you all over the next week or so to come come up with a kind of. Uh, a bit of a call to action you you've got a bit of a call yeah. to action there in terms of let's get on a home yeah. thing so, so um, basically my call to action <laughs> is any women change maker out there please support anna please bring her home she gave everything mm -hmm. everything and there's things i've been reading about her it's like she went over to america and at this point her granddad captain charles stewart he was in his 80s he was, he was retired he was a rear admiral at this point and it's when the Civil War broke out to stop slavery. And Anna Parnell was so against what they were doing to the, the, the black people. And her granddad was so angry about what, what was happening and he wanted to help free these people that he actually wrote to Congress asking if he could come out of retirement. And they're like, no, I'm sorry, you're too old. So he used his own money to create pamphlets to kind of help fight what was happening. Mm -hmm. 
So okay. I think it's amazing It's because it's not, for me, it's not just the one person. It's how everything sits in. It's a bit how like what Jess was saying before. And I know it's a, it's a different yeah. example, but Jess, you know, that research piece that shows how different things are interconnected yeah. is, a, is a, a task and a tool in itself, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Because if it wasn't for Anna's brother, Charles, being a member of parliament and her sitting in the ladies' cage, she probably wouldn't have learned as much politically. But she was very well read. Her, you know, the, her, her basically, Delia, her mom, she was actually related to the Tudors. She was a distant relative, so they were actually kind of related to royalty as well. So I guess that gave them a lot of power and privilege as well. And it was something she could draw on. And I read in one book, they actually knew Napoleon. Mm. They used to go to the White House and meet meet these presidents, etc. And it's it's just crazy because she would have had all these influences on her. And apparently they came up with the term boycotting as well, because the man that used to go around collecting the rents was called Mr. Boycott. And then they were like, you're not paying the rent, we're boycotting. We're all going to band together as a community and we're going to basically shun any landlord that evict you and move anyone else in. And mm. it was the fact that they encouraged people to come together as well. Gosh, I don't know. Oh, there's a lot to take on there, isn't there? Yeah. Both from well, this at the moment, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. So and it's been brilliant because I've been using, I've just called it the Avondale panels. So I'm building their, their family tree up. And this find is, and this is in ancestry. That built, just, yeah, ancestry to build things up. And so, I know, has anybody else on the call ever used Ancestry, just out of interest? I've sort of seen it. I've not paid the subscription, but, you know, there's all sorts of nooks and crannies in. Everybody's got these nooks and crannies in their families. In their, the, DNA the, 123 yeah. are using this service. DNA it is, one, it is two, connected three. to Ancestry somehow, but yeah. I haven't signed up yet. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it feels, I don't know, it feels like there's definitely a couple of follow-up Oh, and what I'll do as well, I'll share, the, I'll share the link because amazingly now there's more information coming out about Anna, etc. So I'll pop the link. Do share that link. Chat. I would say, Soraya, um, you had a link. I, I wondered if your link to your TV channel or the, the program, that the series that you mentioned, if you could put that in the chat, that would be really helpful. Jess um, had a, a link to this Echo thing that that was part of your um, mapping the women and telling yeah, us. I'll put it in. Yeah. I think if we've got all those down here, then we can share those and people can go and have a nosy a bit further. But um, definitely coming back to kind of tease some of these things out further. And, and you know, um, Mariana, I mean, everything you've said within your talk and a lot of it clearly still up front and centre um, in the world right now, you know, there's no doubt a whole range of, 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 of continued stories and continued connections and other things, you know, that you may seek to create a call to action on, you know, from, from these sorts of sort of discussions going forward. So I might, I might, I don't, I might suggest that we try and sort of reconvene <laughs> as a, as a follow up and call to action event, uh, just for maybe um, an hour, one lunchtime within a month, just for anybody who wants to kind of come back and just think, right, what have we digested here? And create those breakouts that it would have been great to create uh, now, but it's 10 to 8 <laughs> and it's dark <laughs> and it'll take me an hour to get home. <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, what a fascinating night. I wonder if anybody else has got any thoughts, reflections, and we've obviously been a captive audience tonight listening in, but gosh, what a lot to listen into. <laughs> anybody? Oh, I forgot anything? to mention one thing. Go on. Um, sorry, I'm tired one day. Um, <laughs> So my grand, my ancestral granddad John, um, he actually moved out to Alabama after the slaves were all free, and he bought the land, and he actually paid people a wage, and helped build the communities up. And he was against, he obviously he was against what was happening to the black people there. He set up a shop, um, where he was actually giving things on credit so they could build the businesses and kind of provide for the families etc it, it, it was the banker dave was he uh, yeah <laughs> and then he actually had a parnell peach he oh, actually did peaches he grew peaches and he had parnell parnell peach. Peach. And you're the parnell peach. peach yeah parnell peach <laughs> but ironically like i said the men they've all got things and he's actually got like monuments over there 
But Anna, hasn't, she's only got a plaque. She's got a plaque at the moment. Well, the story's getting out there starting tonight, Michaela. So, you know, yeah. congratulations so, and well please, done on that. Any woman out there, <laughs> even the men, if you want to help get Anna home, please come along and help me. And at the beginning of this project, mm. and I'm not going to rest till I get home. Absolutely. Wow. Well, oh, yeah. Mine's mine's going now. I hope I hope it's been interesting. I realise it's been a listening session rather than a, a highly engaged one. This one, but I think we're all highly engaged, as you can see in the chat. I'm just listening to um, you know, very moving stories, very uh, practical. You know, you can see practical things that can come as a result of this stuff. And you know, I'm just fascinated. I you know, if you imagine at Flourish Together, we've got hundreds of women change makers in our network, and you know. As a bit of homework, you know, if everybody just took a little bit of time to either look into a heritage story of their interest or one within their own family tree, you'd hear all sorts, no doubt. So um, one for the future. Let's see where we get by International Women's Day uh, 2025. But it feels like there's some options. Um, I just wonder whether before we wrap up, whether there's anybody that has got any reflections or wanted to say anything. I can see everybody sort of chipping away in the chat there. So thank you. And I know some people have had to go a little bit um a little bit sooner but how could we map all the flourish links I, th I just think it's an yeah well it needs to be a conference in its own right i'll have to have a little think we'll pull people together and there's no reason why we couldn't do a day on this stuff i think people i've got to... something to say mm, go for it Jess. So, so i think it's good to have some kind of tangible mm. output plan yeah, yeah. you know because otherwise yeah. you know everybody's really passionate about their uh project mm -hmm. you know their interests and whether or not that's each person plows their own furrow and as you say like a conference or something mm -hmm. there's there's a number of uh, existing initiatives in manchester particularly mm -hmm. the manchester's histories festival mm -hmm. which is now just manchester histories and the, the woman who runs it is called karen shannon um and she's the person to talk to if you want to do any kind of history related stuff they don't they have a little bit of funding but not really what, she but what they karen, have is an umbrella karen what sorry karen, karen shannon i'll put the link shannon. in but they, they've got an umbrella under which you know they've got a massive network of people mm -hmm. so by right. matt i'll come to samir in a minute she's got a hand up and i agree with you jess i think given we've not got a lot of time i will create a follow-up let's come back and tease this stuff out and just look at whether there's a way to piece together that a bit of an action plan or a bit of a, a conference kind of framework to come back and explore some things like this and then see where things go from there. Jess and I, just so people know, have talked about heritage and history of women for a long time. And, you know, whilst it's not up front and centre in terms of social enterprise and what Flourish do, you know, it's a huge part of, um, you know, where we all come from, and what you know, what's got us to this point. So I think... Um, you know, looking at heritage bids and things like that is something we've talked about before. Who knows? Samira, you got your hand up, so I was just going to see yeah. what you have to say. Hi, hey, everyone. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, just a quick point, especially if you're researching heritage or doing work around it, just to be careful and look after yourself. Right? I researched... Um, my heritage with pictures intertwined with my diagnosis and, and sometimes you need to make space to step away for a little while because even if you're not aware at the time it is very heavy and, mm. and, and, and you need to have rest rights uh, mm. from it sometimes so uh, I say especially to Michaela to build that in from the start to step away or look at a different aspect of the research oh yeah and you never know what you're going to find and how it's how you're going to digest it or what it's going to throw up for you to be fair as well no i agree with that because at first when i found out like my ancestral granddad had bought land in alabama at first i thought he was a slaveholder and i was so upset and that was it i just went deep diving to find out everything i could and the relief I felt when I found out he hadn't done that, even though I hadn't done that, I felt awful. Mm. It really bothered me. It really, really bothered me because I'm really proud that I've got a heritage where people have fought for the freedom of others. 
And I really like that. But yeah, you never know the minute with bits you'll find. And I'm conscious there's little kitty winkles in the background. And I know my big kitty winkles at home fed himself, but uh, who knows what, what, what he's up to now. So I'm probably going to start to wrap wrap things up for now. I hope I hope that the offer of a follow-up event is of interest or at least enough for now to sort of see where we, we go next. And then who knows, we're all pretty uh, self-starting and organised. So something will evolve. Um. And there's our little change makers of the future saying, come on, mom, it's time to get off this Zoom. <laughs> okay. All right. About Thanks right for thing. organizing, so, Michaela. No, thank you so much to all Bye-bye. of our speakers Bye-bye. so far. Bye-bye. And, thank um, you. Glad we've got lots of different people listening in and we'll um, we'll speak soon. Press the red button. Thank Bye. you. Bye.